Welcome to the Facts vs. Feelings podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Dietrich, and I'm joined by my co-host, Sonu Varghese. Cutting through the noise in 30 minutes each week, taking out the boring and helping investors focus on what really matters. A quick note before we start the show, investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Carson Partners, a division of CWM LLC, is a nationwide partnership of advisors. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 30th episode of Carson's Facts versus Feelings. I'm Ryan Dietrich, the Chief Market Strategist, joined by Sonu Varghese. And Sonu, your title is? Uh, Vice President, comma, comma, uh, Global Macro Strategist. Sorry, I couldn't resist okay. the comma. Uh, it, I know. It's, it's, it's important to bring the comma in, we've learned. So anyway, so everybody, uh, this is the 30th episode. That's like a, that's like a, does it mean we're getting older? We're getting wiser, Sony? What does that mean? We've hey, got 30. You know, I, I'll, I'll take 30 over 50. Neither of us are 50. <laughs> I should note. But. <laughs> uh, but somebody, I think someone on our team turned 29 today. That's Burt White. And who knows if Burt will even listen to this. We're not going to tell him we mentioned his name. We'll see if he right. listens to our podcast. Burt yeah. hired me. He's our... Um, our leader our on leader. the research team, I think, is what we'll call him. Fearless yeah. leader. So happy birthday to Bert, happy um, birthday, for sure. Yeah. So, now, now, so when we do this, we do use Riverside. I can see you down there. We post this to the to our uh, Carson Group YouTube channel. I don't know if it's me or if your head is a little bigger. And uh, you're a very well grounded guy. But what did you do <laughs> yesterday? Yesterday, you were you were the star of the show. Tell the listeners what you did, which I know is not always what you do, but you were a keynote speaker, am I correct? Or what was it at, exactly? At the, yeah, no, it was a great honor, to be honest, I mean, from uh, at the Retirement Income Summit. So mm-hmm. I was a keynote speaker there. And, you know, I channeled my inner Ryan Dietrich. I, I showed you tables <laughs> and charts. And, you know, and everyone's so, I, uh, it gets to the title of this episode, right? Everyone's so pessimistic. And even the morning before my talk, I mean, I was talking about your tables, charts, you know, employment's doing well. We're going to talk about all of that. We have been talking about it for the last few months, too, yep. and our outlook. And it was like a jolt, really, I think, for everybody in the room to get like, oh, my God, why is he so optimistic? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, it's different. So I, I don't know if I mentioned the title yet or not, but we're calling this one Things You Don't See in a Recession. We've there seen a lot of signals just in the last week, uh, if not longer, that are just things you don't see in a recession. So we want to point some of those positives out. Sona and I are uh, also going to take a look at inflation. Remember last week we mentioned how PPI and CPI were coming out. Well, those came out and did pretty well overall. So we're going to dive into that. And then f- we're going to finish things up with depending how much time we have. Uh, but just market sentiment. It's fascinating to me. The negativity, kind of like what Sona just mentioned, a bunch of sentiment polls. Things just came out in the last week that are truly everyone showing like off the charts bearishness which as we speak, we're breaking out to like nearly the highs for the year on the S&P 500. The Dow is right there, too. So we'll get into all that stuff, but just fascinating uh, situation. So, so new again, the title of the 30th, the big 3-0, the 30th episode of Carson's Facts versus Feelings, Ryan and Sonu is called Things You Don't See in a Recession. We probably could talk two hours <laughs> on, on a lot of this stuff. <laughs> I'll just start with this. My friend Charlie Bolello, he shared some charts I thought were fascinating. Ferrari, the the Car company at an all-time high. Louis Vuitton, the, the incredibly expensive retailer, at an all-time high. I'll just start with, you wouldn't expect to see those things making new highs. So do that leads us to the consumer. You do amazing work for our Carson partners every single day. Uh, you know, we had retail sales recently. There's some other consumption data. Wherever you want to take this, just take it. But tell me things we're seeing from the consumer that you just don't see in the recession that everybody tells us we're in. Uh, I'm going to put in that uh, that thing about Ferrari, Louis Vuitton is so interesting. Let's put a pin in that. Let's yes. come back. Let's talk about the American consumer first, right? I mean, one thing is, I was talking about the summit yesterday. When you talk consumption, look, consumption has been fairly strong over the last three months, right? Remember, when we came into this year, and goodness, after the SVB price, everyone's like, recession, 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 right? 65% mm-hmm. probability based on you know economist forecast of a recession, right? In between, we had that little small period when, uh, you know, January employment data came out and 500,000 jobs, and suddenly it was overheating. And then it was like, oh, good news is bad news. You can't win with this stuff. (laughs) I'll I'll just chime in real fast. But we said, oh, it's because the weather was good. Everyone just gave this, ah, it's good, but, you know, kind of like a compliment, but a backhanded compliment because the weather was good. Although I did buy a car in January when it was warm like everybody (laughs) else. So I I was just as guilty, but I love my new car, by the way. Goodbye, Volvo. (laughs) Volvo, there you go. You know, uh, 
no, uh, no guesses on Ryan's age there based on his uh, Volvo purchase. But well, well, I got rid of the Volvo. I got rid of the Volvo. Oh, you got so rid no, of the Volvo. Yeah, okay, you got, got that's what I got rid of. Yeah, enough okay. of that car. But anyway, um, what else? What no, else we no, see from the consumer? Going back, like, and the weather issue is a good point, right? Because everyone said, "Oh, January is strong because of weather." Mm-hmm. It's going to correct in you know in, mm-hmm. in March when the March data came out, right? Employment's going to correct. Retail sales are going to correct. Auto sales going to correct. All of that. It's going to reverse because surely Q1 cannot be stronger than Q4 of 2022 because what? Everyone's predicting a recession going into this year. But boom, what did we get? I mean, you know, things retreated, I would say, a little bit. I mean, employment was still, goodness, strong. We talked about last week, 236,000 jobs. And retail sales came in, you know, it fell slightly. But you look at the average over three months, right? It's about... Uh, 1.9% after adjusting for inflation, by the way, after adjusting for inflation, 1.9% over three months. That is almost 8% at an annualized pace. That is huge. That is massive. And I'm talking about real Those are, growth. That is, a, that is a thing. That's a thing you don't see in a recession, to bring it back to the title of this Thank podcast. Thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> yeah. And coming back to Louis Vuittons and Ferraris, by the way, a big purchase. These are all luxury goods, right? Sure. Uh, and Guess who purchases luxury goods around the world? The Chinese. You just got Chinese mm-hmm. data yesterday. China's GDP was about 4.5%. By the way, that's without a lot of stimulus even, right? Retail sales in China were up about 10.5% year over year. That's the largest gain we've seen in about two years, right? That's massive again. Wow. Like, what are the odds that China is doing really well and the, you know, and the U.S. goes into a recession? I don't know. I, I don't see that happening. Yeah, you know, we've talked before the last couple of months, one of the positive drivers this year that we didn't have last year was that just that China's reopening and they reopened and fits and starts and Lucy with the football and Charlie Brown multiple times last year. But it really feels like they mean it this time. They've had some COVID outbreaks. They're not shutting everything down. I mean, and that's that's just another potential positive for the global economy that we didn't see. Now, I will say um, uh, Larry Fink over at BlackRock, he had this quote uh, just last week. Not sure of a recession in 2023, maybe early 2024. Now, not calling out Larry, not going to, but lots of people have been saying this recession's coming. Then we keep getting this data you're talking about, and they keep punting it back. Believe me, everybody, we're going to have a recession eventually. But if you listen to this podcast for long enough, we've said it's probably not going to be 2023. We might have been one of the very few people to say that. Now, one of the largest money managers, CEO of that company, I believe he's CEO of the company, the guy in charge of BlackRock is saying maybe we push it back. So, a couple more from me, then I'll go back to you that I found interesting. If I can find it in front of me here, I know I've got it somewhere. Um, Bank of America, they, they look at their with their credit cards. This is again, mm-hmm. Bank of America customers, yes, uh, up nine percent in terms of spending. That's the first quarter year over year, very hey, Ryan, impressive. And then, on, on yep, go ahead and explain it a little. Card, yep. On that credit card spending, here's the bearish case, bearish take, right? That you hear from yep. all the pessimists. Oh my god, credit card. Debt is so high, right? Right. That's the other side of that. But, but yeah, no, look, spending's good. That's positive. And that, and that's the next part of this. You look at credit utilization, something we've talked about before. If you've got a ten thousand dollar credit union uh, credit, you're using maybe two grand of it. That's the utilization, how much you're using. That is still well below the 2019 levels, and they actually break it out by income earners, and all three of those are still there. So, yes, overall credit card debt's over a trillion dollars with the T, an all time high. That's what we hear every quarter when that data comes out from our friends at the friends at the Fed. And the media run with it. But again, if you look at how much people are using relative to their overall credit, it's nowhere near as high. So to say people are maxing out their credit cards, I just don't uh, I don't see that. So just some other things. I mean, so the Empire State I want to talk about this. I know it's a regional survey and I sure. know it's those are volatile. It came out yesterday. Right. Wow, is all I can say. Wow. <laughs> if the economy is uh, is uh, anything like the Empire State, we don't have a recession at all. What did you see when you dug into that data? I, I mean, I, I think with a lot, a lot of these things, like you said, these regional surveys, these are mm-hmm. surveys of purchasing managers, ma- mm-hmm. managers for different companies in that region, right? The Philadelphia Federal yep. Reserve does it. That's a an Empire other, State would be New, New York, York, right? New York, right? And that's where one of the big banks just went under, right? One right. of the, uh, right. which one exactly. was it? Sovereign? Which bank? What bank was it? So signature. Uh, Signature, my, we always talk about SVB, but the Signature was bank. the other bank, the yes. crypto bank in New York. Yes. So uh, what did you see, though, in that in that data? No, look, uh, I think with a lot of these things, markets, you know, we say markets don't like to be surprised, but they don't mind being surprised in the positive direction. And that really was what, you know, uh, the survey says, because we've got like 
other manufacturing surveys saying, oh, manufacturing's weak, it may be contracting. Right. I mean, there's like mixed signals there. I mean, industrial production is sort of positive. You know, again, it's one of those stories where January is really positive, but March retreated a bit, but it didn't cancel out January. So quarter over the entire quarter, things are looking okay. But surveys are saying there's a bit of a contraction. And that's why when the regional uh, New York Empire State Manufacturing Index came out, it's like, oh, wait, that's not bad. That's pretty positive. And then prices paid too. That was the other side of it, right? Prices paid. Mm -hmm. We keep talking about inflation, supply chains, fitness, input prices are going down. Right. That's great for, by the way, it's great for margins. Right. And it's great, mm -hmm. great for the end consumer, too, because, you know, company companies don't have to push out prices to the end con uh, consumer. Absolutely. So looking at the April Empire State, we saw new orders, the highest since April 22. Mm -hmm. Shipments, the higher since April 22. Um, and then let's see what else we have. Oh, prices paid. Prices. Huge drop down 8.9 to 33. So and again, the. The majority of the, the charts that I looked at when you look at this this data piece, we're all just trending higher, right? Again, yes, one data piece, yes, one regional manufacturing that can be volatile. We, we understand that, but it sure looked positive. The other one that caught my attention uh, recently, J.P. Morgan, their global PMI composite is now up. Four months in a row, not necessarily yeah. what you think if we're heading to this ma massive uh, global global recession we keep hearing about. Um, and it, 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 let's see here, it came in at 53.4, which was the highest since December of 21. Um, now, again, that combines manufacturing and service manufacturing, still just a hair underneath 50. So contraction of services globally is up over 54. And again, it's just one survey, JP Morgan's. But it just tells a story, Sony, that we're not in a recession, right? Yeah, uh, I think that's it. Just plain and simple. We're not in a recession. It doesn't look like we will be in the recession over the next few months either, right? And, and it gets back to, oh, maybe they could have a recession in 2024. And and you mm -hmm. think about the out when you think about like an outlook for you know 12 months later, 18 months later. Sure, the yeah, we could get a recession then, right? But that's always sure. going to be the case. It's never not going to be the case that you know, yeah, that could be a recession 16 months from now. If you ask yeah, me, yeah, I, I absolutely. would say that, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, we had what I believe a two month recession right about three years ago. So this economic expansion is about yeah. three years old. I mean, you know, right. the average expansion is ballpark five. So, yeah, 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 I mean, we could have a recession sometime. Yeah. But again, we just don't we aren't seeing it yet. We're not no. seeing it in no. the data. And that's something that we've been talking about a lot. Industrial production. I like this one because we talk about the surveys, right? And the surveys are saying mm -hmm. one thing. But industrial production, Sonu, once again, the headline number can be a tad more than expected. It is near all time highs. I mean, talk to me about why that matters. Look, uh, that's basically how much manufacturing firms are producing. Manufacturing, yep. and then there's oil and gas drilling, things like that, right? And by the way, this is, you know, we talk about sales and adjusting those for inflation. When the Fed puts out industrial production data, that's actually already adjusted for inflation because it's like looking at volumes, right? And things like the PMIs, Purchasing Manager, uh, Purchasing Manager Index, those are surveys, and that's kind of telling you, okay, what is... You know, that's a leading indicator, right, for things like manufacturing production. But industrial production is actual data, right, from actual firms. It's a massive survey, right? And, and yeah, that's been, you know, you compare where how much American firms are producing today, especially manufacturing firms, it's actually slightly higher than what we are producing at the end, you know, just before the pandemic. Like just so say that one more time. Say that. Say that. Just say that one more time, because I think what you just said might be the most important thing we've heard this whole podcast. Yeah. Say that one more time. The amount of goods that American manufacturing firms are producing is more than they were producing just before the pandemic. Yeah, and the economy was in pretty good shape February of two thousand and twenty right. until if we, we can say so ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Ab go. Absolutely. Um, so let, let me just see here. I, I know what else we want to talk about before we move forward. Oh, er, let's talk about earnings for a minute. Want to talk about earnings for a minute? Yeah. Um, it's very early in earnings season. Earnings are expected to drop ballpark 5% or so, but we've just seen a ton of negativity. And again, it's early, but you look at JP Morgan, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. Those. <laughs> I get all choked up talking about this. Um, so excited. JP Morgan, City, exactly. And so again, the financials start things off. And let's let's be very clear here. What's the one group that we're worried about? It's financials because of everything that just happened with the banking crisis that we saw this time exactly one month ago. JP Morgan profits up 52%, revenue up 25%. Uh, the stock was up 7% on Friday on that reaction. All three of them made 
$22 billion in profits, up 33% from last year, and revenue of all three of them, approximately $80 billion, up about 20% from a year ago. I'll just say it again. Things you don't see in a recession. I mean, how fascinating is that to you, Sonu, that financials were that strong when everyone said, oh, here we go. Here comes the big one. Here comes a big one. Here comes a credit crunch. And this, you know, Mm -hmm. the day we are recording this morning, Bank of America reported as well, their net interest margin. This is the difference between what they charge for loans minus what they pay for depositors, right? And everyone is expecting that to be about, for Bank of America, about 24%, that difference. And Mm -hmm. that grew instead more than that. I think it grew by 25% or something. So just to say it was high and it beat expectations. Right. So over the last quarter, and this is a quarter, like you said, with everyone's worried about goodness, what's a bank? What are the, what's going to happen to the banks? What's going to happen to the credit crunch? And uh, people are talking about, you know, maybe banks won't lend money out anymore. But, you know, mm-hmm. speaking of things you don't see in a recession, look at spreads. We keep talking. We've talked about spreads. Yeah. We've explained spreads before right. corporate spreads, which is the difference between what investors charge companies for loans. Uh, against you know what the tre- what treasuries yield right that spread mm-hmm. is that you know what we track and usually those things go up during recessions that's not in a very bad place right now I mean far from what we would expect in a recession same thing with high yield spreads right companies that are rated junk and you know those companies typically have a hard time borrowing money and an even harder time if we are in a recession or near a recession it's not the case right now. Right. Absolutely. You know, this time a month ago, I mean, some some well-known shops uh, were lowering their targets on the S&P 500. They were cutting right. uh, estimates. They were th- 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 t- selling in some of the models and portfolios they run for their particular clients or advisors or partners. Here at the Carson Group, if you listen to this podcast, one month ago, approximately right now, Ballpark Sona, we actually added equity risk. We added yes. XLF, the financial ETF, financial ETF. Uh, to some of the models. And we said this is an opportunity. Now, here we are a month later, and it's looking pretty good. Believe me, we're not out of the woods by any means. But again, it's just fascinating. We're going to talk about sentiment at the end. But it's just fascinating the, the mood a month ago. And now here we are a month later. And it's like, okay, well, there's no recession coming anytime soon. And, you know, there probably was another buying opportunity. I just saw, let's, last thing we'll talk about, I just saw on CNBC, they talked about Chinese uh, GDP came in at one, uh, I'm sorry, 4.5% in the first quarter versus expected four. Believe me, nobody really trusts Chinese data, I'll be honest. Yeah. But when I see industrial production strong and we see the Empire uh, State Manufacturing strong, that's probably the stuff we want to see that says China's legit. Let's talk about U.S. GDP for a second. I think at the end of January, first quarter, expect to be up like less than 1%. So that's the Atlanta Fed GDP now. I think I said it right. Sometimes I mix yes. those words up. But you, you get the, you get the picture. They, our friends in the Atlanta Fed, led by... Um, uh, chairperson Bostic, um, who actually had the swear jar. Uh, that's why I like Bostic. He had oh, the swear jar. He said the word transitory a couple years ago. Uh, <laughs> you had to give money. So I, I always, I always like, I was like that. Um, anyway, that's pretty funny. Um, I forget where I was going with this. So what was I even no, talking? I got the, all sidetracked. The, what was I talking the, about? I got sidetracked by the quarter, swear jar. GDP. First there it GDP is. Forecast. What is? What are we saying now? Thank you for bringing. That's why we have a two man podcast. Sometimes I go on a rant. <laughs> Get what I was talking about. What are you? What is the Atlanta Fed saying now for first quarter? If it was less than one percent this time a couple months ago. I mean, it could have changed you know even over the last good point day, but but it's about two and a half percent let's just say it's about two and a half percent right now yes that is what it is i just looked in it's you know uh, most economists are actually at about one percent one and a half percent something like that i mean a lot of people are at zero right yep. and uh, right so they don't expect any growth and the atlanta fed i i mean these you know i i would take these num the exact number two and a half percent but with a pinch of salt, things could go, you know, mm-hmm, could be higher sure. or could be lower, right? But it's always like, okay, what's adding to it? That's what's interesting, right? And what's pushing GDP growth up to and a half percent? I mean, which is pretty high. Let's say that's if it does come out as two and a half percent first quarter GDP, that would be faster than you know the average GDP growth we saw over the last expansion. Yeah, that's very good. This is when everyone's calling for a recession, by the way, just to put this in perspective. What's pushing this higher, Ryan? Consumption, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Based on the data, I mean, I'm not saying it could be correct. There's, in fact, there's a good chance it'll be, you know, it's not going to be exactly that. But based on what they're forecasting, they're forecasting consumption to add about 2.84 percentage points to GDP. There are other things that pull, pull it down. Consumption, yeah. 2.84% points, right? That would, if it does come out anywhere close to that, that would be close to the highest we've seen during any quarter between 2010 and 2019. Wow. Let that sink in, right? 
That's what well, again is things doing. Hello. things things you don't see in a recession. So again, you know these the Atlanta Fed can move fairly quickly, but again, or their their GDP now forecast can move quickly, but still just real um real positives, real strength. And yeah. if we do hit say let's say two and a half percent or so, I'm just going by memory here. But if you guys remember the last several years. The first quarter has always been weak. Not always. I can't say always. But the majority of these years yeah, really. lately, first quarter has been weak. We've kind of come back, you know, for these seasonals or pick a reason, you know. Oh, by the way, it's tax day. It's tax day. So hopefully everybody's got their taxes done by the time. April 15th. This. No, this, this is April 18th. Oh, yeah. It's, it's April 18th. Oh, but it is tax day today. Yeah. Our friends in the government gave us a little extra time, apparently, to get that all squared up. Um, yeah. But anyway, so so historically, though, the you know, first quarter has been weak-ish. Again, maybe since 2010, we'll say. But not this time. <laughs> not looking like no. this time. Well, so do, you know. I knew we'd spend most of the time on that. We've got about 10 minutes or so for the rest of the discussion. I will say, I mentioned this before we started. So obviously I've got headphones on, right? If you see on the YouTube channel and I've never noticed this, but like the cord, the cord on my headphones keeps like twisting all up and it's driving me absolutely crazy. It's like, it's supposed to be like a six foot cord. And it's like a two foot cord. So anyway, I think I'm surviving. Keeps, it's just, it's bugging keeps me a little happening bit. To my, I, I have an iPhone. I keeps happening to my iPhone mm-hmm. charger, the wires. And then, Finally, it yep. doesn't charge one fine day, and I'm like, oh, my God. It's at, always at the worst possible time, right? Oh, oh yeah. it so, doesn't charge, and then you have to go buy a new charger. New wire. Never fails. <laughs> yeah, it never fails. I mean, we, we we had spring break recently. We talked about that. I'm me, me on the plane with my kids. Everybody's got, like, a phone or a device, and we shove all the wires in, like, one bag, and you're on the plane. And it's just amazing at how twisted up those wires get because i know i didn't put them in the bag that way but then they come out of the bag and it, it takes you half the flight just to untwist everything yeah. and of course oh. if your kid can't get on their phone the first 30 seconds of being on a plane oh. i mean you know that's the end of the plane your trip around, right there I mean, you know it's like oh my goodness but anyway all right well so to the second thing we wanted to talk about we won't spend a ton of time here but inflation the cpi the consumer level inflation and the ppi the producer level inflation uh both came out last week i've got the numbers on them i think you do too we can start with cpi that's kind of the CPI. one that gets the headlines although ppi dropped more um march was up i'm sorry wrong word march was down 0.5 percent versus flat so down more than expected year over year um oh that's ppi apologies, ppi apologies. cpi was yeah, that's, that number about- that number sounded low that number <laughs> sounded low i'm sorry I mean, uh, here we go that uh, would you be know. good <laughs> oh, that'd be really good. Okay, sorry. Let's start over. Uh, CPI um, up 0.1% month over month, yeah. expected up 0.2. Year over year, about 5% versus 5.2. That's the headline. Core came in right about as expected, up 0.4% and 5.6 year over year. Um, you know, you've had time to think about it. Overall, market reacted just fine to the data. What do you think of the CPI data? Mostly good. There's a little parts mm-hmm. of it that's concerning. Not for, I think, the economy overall or any of us, to be honest. It's more for the Fed, right? With, with a lot of these things, yep. it's like you, you look at the data and there's two lenses, right? One lens is, oh, is it actually good or bad? It's fine. Sure. And then it's like the lens to, oh, I wonder how the Fed is going to look at it. <laughs> then that's mm-hmm. where, you know, we're usually concerned, right? Or will they take this as good news or bad news? And then, you know, you're playing three, you're playing three card Monty there with, you know, what the Fed is going to do. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, look, CPI was up. Year over year, which is what most people see on the headlines and the newspapers, things like that. CPI was up 5% year over year in March, right? A year and a half ago, it was 5.5%, right? Uh, it's about September 2021. I'm looking at my numbers charts here. It hit a peak of 9.1% in June mm-hmm. of last year. That's a big drop. Let's, you know, we can look at the head underneath the hood and all that. But that's, I think, the big headline, right? We were at 9% inflation last year in June. We are at nine months later, we are at 5%. Mm. That's a massive deceleration. And no no real signs, I don't think, of slowing down. You know, eggs, remember we had the big egg yeah. crisis two months ago, and that was very real. Prices of eggs yeah. were soaring. Yeah. Eggs were down, I believe, 10 or 11% right. uh, different parts. So, so, you know, the one thing, though, I want to dive in, and we've talked a lot about this, is shelter. Shelter makes yes. up, I believe, it's 41% of core CPI. Core so CPI. let's just call it a big part of it. Mm-hmm. You know, that's because rents have been high and the shelter component's been higher. Stickier, maybe is a better word to use. So service has been stickier. It looks like you're telling me there's a chance to quote Jim Carrey. You're telling me there's a chance. Shelter is finally peaking. That means it might be rolling over the second half of this year. You want to dive into that? Here's the good news. The 9% inflation from last year has come down to 5%, and that's mostly because of energy. And now food is joining mm-hmm. the club with food is decelerating. You mentioned eggs and yeah. pretty much across the board, right? Price of butter and peanut butter. All yeah, groceries were down like 0.3%. That. So, yeah, yeah. Th- th- going the right way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Exactly. And, and hopefully we should soon see that feed into, like, restaurant food prices and things like that, right? But 
what what's still keeping CPI up at five percent? Five percent is still high, by the way, right? It's just that it's a lot sure. better than nine percent, and we're not in hyperinflation or anything like that, right? We still want it to come down to five to two. What's going to do that? Housing. You mentioned housing is like forty percent of core CPI. It's about a third of the overall CPI basket, right? Uh, core CPI is excluding food and energy. So right. we've seen that we've talked about this, you know, so much. Even last year, right? This was in an outlook. We thought, okay, come. Mm-hmm. You know, we're seeing market rents go down. It's decelerated. You know, if you look at apartment list, uh, market rents yeah. are up 18% year over year, about, goodness, a year and a half ago almost, right? It's so it, mm-hmm. It's like ages ago. Now it's down to under 3% year over year. That's a massive deceleration. We didn't see that in official CPI rents at all until mm-hmm. March. Things have started coming down. So average price growth per year in official rental inflation was about 0.8%, you know, for several months bef- uh, until February. Last month, it dropped to, I'm looking at my numbers here, about half a percent. Half a percent, by the way, it's still yeah. high, but that's a big drop. And that's a, goodness, that's a huge relief. I think hopefully oh. that in, we're at that inflection point, we're at that turning point. Yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. housing going forward should pull core inflation lower. Absolutely. You know, Case Shiller, the housing data, that's been coming down. You look at Zillow, some of the yep. data they have, it's been been uh, been decreasing as well. So those are some positive things. I mean, the Fed wanted housing to slow down. The Fed, you could argue, crashed the housing market last year with what they did. Um, and, and you know, you could say there's almost a depression. You mentioned GDP, different components. The, the yep. housing component last year obviously was quite negative to that GDP. Was a big but yeah. Yeah, but but the truth is, again, the CPI is, is coming back. And one of the reasons, back in late January, when we were even weight equities here at the Carson Group, the re- research team, we went overweight. And you know you gave us a funny look. We got a few funny looks when we made that decision. I feel we like said we still inflation get funny was, looks. Yeah, we still do. In March, when we added, <laughs> believe me, we got some funny looks then, too. But when we stopped getting funny looks, then maybe I'll start to worry. I'll just say that. Yes. But, you know, when we added, one of the reasons in December we were so optimistic about this year was just this reason. We thought inflation's going to come back, but back faster than most. Most people thought because these rents and things are going to really start to um, pull inflation lower, and that leaves the door open for the Fed to stop hiking so aggressively. And there's a lot more to it, but mainly the consumer being so strong is kind of the easiest way to put it. These are things we've been talking about for four or five months now, and then a lot of them are potentially playing out, which is a nice thing. Let's not spend too much time on PPI. This is a producer level. This is what I start. I hint. I gave this away already. Um, <laughs> down 0.5 percent month over month versus flat year over year. 2.7. From a peak of 11.6, you talk about a roller coaster. Overall, the producer levels even coming down faster, apparently, all of a sudden. Sonu, what does that mean? I think that should just be a mic drop right there, right? PPI was 11.6%. This is March of 2022, literally a year ago. Right now, it's at 2.7%. What more do you need? Um, That says it all. Yes, right. that that, that says says a lot. (laughs) I mean, I could go into the numbers. I mean, just real quick. Yeah. You know, underneath that, one thing PPI does is obviously the prices uh, that producers pay, right? Things, uh, prices for that business, uh, for items businesses use to produce end goods, you know, Mm -hmm. that the rest of us consume. But it also, the PPI also has this thing called trade services. It actually doesn't mention, uh, it it refers to retail margins, really. I won't get into the details of it. You know, I think it's, it's been on a blog. I mean, we write this stuff for our partners in yep. the daily update I produce. So uh, without getting into it, we'll say it measures retailers' margins. That's coming down, right? That's the big story. Mm-hmm. It peaked at 19% uh, year over year in March of 2022. Right now, that's at 2.5%, right? Same mm-hmm. story. Wow. I, I think that says it all. It's literally like uh, it goes up, it comes down. And we're pretty much where we were before the crisis, before the pandemic. What's What's this saying about the stock market? Escalator up, but elevator down, right? I think it's, a, yeah. you know, you're slow and steady on the way up and you're fast down. But it feels like this was an escalator up and just as quickly an escalator yeah. back down. So the final thing, Sona, we wanted to touch on was just overall market sentiment. I, I traded options for 11 years. I love the idea of looking at market sentiment as a piece of the pie when you're when you're talking about what the world might do. Because, again, things the market is a forward-looking mechanism. It's pricing things in. 
bad news is priced in, good news is priced in. It's always, you know, looking and it, it, it's smarter than any of us and arguing with the market's going to get you nowhere. I've learned that in my more than two decades of doing this. But what fascinated me just in the last several days, so new a couple, I'll just rip them off here. There's four of them that stood out to me. Just today, the Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey, the monthly survey, more than $600 billion of investment professionals. We talked about it a lot. Uh, 5.5 cash, still one of the highest levels we've seen in years, wow. but their stocks to bond ratio is the most um, underweight since the great financial crisis. So people trust Amazing. stocks rolled to the bonds less than any time since the great financial crisis. That's number one. There was a JP Morgan survey of, of institutional investors. 95%, this is fascinating, 95% of them expect stocks to drop the rest of this year. Only wow. like 5% expect flat. Virtually nobody expects stocks to be higher from this point forward, according to this JP Morgan institution. Wow. They survey. haven't seen Amazing. your tables. The one with, you I know, what it, stocks yeah. do after they gain 7% in a quarter, what they do, you know, Ooh. after two back-to-back -back quarters of 5%. I literally talked about this yesterday. Yeah, well, and, and that was last week's podcast. So go ch listen, I listed a lot of different, this is rare, this is rare, this is bullish, this is bullish type of thing. Also, carsongroup.com, you can go to our blog where I listed some of those. But yes, a lot of the things we've seen would be wildly in the face of negative stock returns right now and why we remain overweight, honestly. Um, let's see, that's that one. S&P Global had a survey. Risk appetite is the lowest since April of 22. They, uh, they look at about 300 different in institutional investors. And the final one, large spec, I like this. Those other ones were surveys, so take that with a grain of salt. I still think it's important to pay attention. Um, well, actually, the global fund manager, maybe it's not quite a survey. It is supposed to be what they're doing with money, but here's with right. real assets, real money. Large speculators on S&P 500 futures are the most net short they've been since October 2011. You can go back multiple times, wow. like 2015, 2016, uh, the, the, uh, the COVID times. When you see, this is hedge funds. And so hedge funds are extremely net short. Now, let's be very clear. Maybe they're hedging. Maybe they're not necessarily net sure. short. Whatever it is, when we've seen um, S&P 500 speculator, large speculators this net short, it has marked some major buying opportunities. Now, I will be very clear. The chart that circled around on, on uh, Twitter, a lot of people shared this. It didn't go back all the way to the great financial crisis. Before the great financial crisis, yes, hedge funds were net short. You could argue they were they were dead right going into that to at least be hedged or maybe outright short. But still, the last several times, if you don't think we're about to head into a financial crisis like we have laid out many times, mm -hmm. this looks like, once again, everyone's on one side of the boat, the opportunity's on the other. If everyone's thinking alike, somebody isn't thinking – General Patton, thank you, General Patton. I've used that probably a million times. I, I mean, Sona, that. we're at the end of the line, but how fascinating is it that the economy looks decent? The stock market's like breaking out to almost yearly highs, or at least uh, new highs this year, I should say. Strong first quarter, back to back strong quarters, historically really strong, yet nobody believes it. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah. our friend Sam Rowe, you know, we had Sam on the podcast yes. a couple of weeks ago, and I highly recommend everyone listen to that. He's such a fascinating you know thinker and writer and all of that he just put this up on twitter i'm looking at it a record record by the way 69 percent of the public holds negative views yep. about the economy both now and in the future according to cnbc's latest all america economic survey i mean wow i i, I mean all i can say is look we've listed this stuff out i i think the case is i mean sure can things fall off a cliff yeah we know that we you know we saw that happen in mm -hmm. march 2020 with covid Right. But as of now, unless you're predicting something like that, some crazy black swan event, like you said, a financial crisis that comes out of the blue or, you know, mm -hmm. and yet another pandemic. Goodness, hopefully not. But yeah, you have to think things are OK now. I, I mean, at what point is it OK to say things are fine, Ryan? But can we well, say that? we've been. <laughs> We've we've been doing it for 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 a while, I guess. But yeah, I, I don't know what to say there other than it is really fascinating. But the Carson Investment Research Group continues to think stocks are going to do pretty well in this environment going forward. We said at the start of the year, S and P would gain between twelve to fifteen percent. We're like halfway there. We said bonds between three to five percent. So bonds would do just okay, but we like stocks more. Bonds have done okay this year. Haven't been spectacular, but after losing eleven percent last year in the Barclays Ag worst year ever, bonds have done better. So overall. We still see a lot of positives. So, do any final comments in 30 seconds, and then it'll bring us home. No, I, I think uh, there's a lot to, you know, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to get a read on, you know, it's it's old data in a sense, right? But it gets you uh, a read on the economy with GDP and personal consumption, things like that. I think things are heading to the right, in the right direction. So what will actually be interesting is the Fed's meeting come May. What did they mm -hmm. do next? Yeah. Right? My May take 3rd. is... 
I mean, you know, I could be wrong completely. I don't think they will raise rates, but I could be off. Maybe they raise it 25 basis points or hmm. something like that. So I don't think they will, but we'll see. Yeah, that's we'll definitely something that. we'll talk. We'll talk about that a lot, lot more as we go forward. Again, happy birthday to Bert White, managing yes, director, happy birthday, chief, sir. Uh, chief, chief strategy officer, I yes, believe. Sir. I don't think he's got a comma in his name. I hope I didn't <laughs> mess up his title. We get in trouble, but happy birthday to Bert there, and um, everyone. Thank you for listening to the thirtieth episode of Carson's Facts versus Feelings with Ryan and Sono. Titled it again: Things You Don't See in a Recession. We hope you enjoyed this one. We'll be back very soon. We wish everyone um, happy investing and a, and a great week. We'll talk soon. Take care. Information provided on Facts versus Feelings with Sono Varghese and Ryan Dietrich are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. The statements and opinions of show guests may not be reflective of CWM LLC or its affiliates. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested in directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy assures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Guests on Facts vs. Feelings are not affiliated with CWM LLC.